Welcome, my friends. I hope you're all having an excellent 2020 so far. And today, guys, we're going to be jumping right in and talking about the 10 best items in Total War Warhammer 2 multiplayer. So these are items that are absolute game changers, have really been staples in the metagame for their respective factions, and that if you see the character picked that has access to this item, it's pretty much going to be brought every single time. So also, guys, before we begin, this video is not a list video, so it's not going to be a top 10, there's not going to be a worst, there's not going to be a best, because circumstantially, many of these items are just better in different circumstances. So on that note, guys, let us begin by talking about the first item here on the list, which is going to be King Luan's Mighty Sword. The Sword of Caron. Now this item is, is great and it's really solid on Luan. He's highly mobile. So basically he can stick and move around the battlefield wherever this debuff is needed, he can apply it. So what it does is when you activate it, it has a two minute cooldown, a 30 meter range. So it's pretty tight quarters. It's not going to be a super big radius, but it's big enough to really affect one big heavy calf fight, a lord fight, something like that. So it lowers melee defense by 24 and armor by 30. So it has some really nice synergies with some of the other Bretonian Knights, Grail Knights, Knights of the Realm. These units don't necessarily have the best AP values, but with King Luan and the Sword of Corone nearby, you can pop it and suddenly their anti-large bonus is going to be more than enough when you bring units like Chaos Knights down by 30 armor or anything else like a Dragon Ogre Shagath down to 40 armor from 70. It's a pretty big game changer for sure. And those big force multiplying battlefield or battlefield kind of augmenting effects are, are huge. And you guys will see as we go over the course of this list, there are several items just like this bad boy. So the Sword of Crone certainly belongs in this list. King Luan, in my opinion, as you guys saw in the previous video that we put up about a week ago, is the best Bretonian Lord. So the fact that the best Bretonian Lord has one of the best items in the game, it is no coincidence, but it's partially because of this glorious item itself. So now guys, we're gonna be jumping on over to the realm of the Foul Beastmen for the Stave of Ruinous Corruption. So this is the item that Warker the Shadow gave wields, and basically allows him to summon a group of Chaos Spawn relatively close to him. It does have decent range. You can actually go 60 meters, so you can go behind enemy front lines, summon some spawn on top of their archers, summon it behind their infantry lines, and then bring the spawn crashing in to attack their infantry. And this item used to be even better. Oh man, when Warker first came out, he had the ability to summon two groups of spawn with this item and two groups of spawn with his spirit essence, which was insane. Warker the Shadow gave used to bring like 4,000 gold worth of spawn to the battlefield. It was really powerful, but nonetheless, pretty simplistic item. It's just a summoning item, summons a group of spawn, but basically you're getting a thousand gold worth of free value on the battlefield. And it's a unit that nowadays with some buffs and changes is actually a pretty good unit. It causes poison, it hits hard, it's unbreakable, certainly no joke. So the next item we're going to be talking about is going to be in the realm of the Dark Elves. It's the Heart Render and the Dark Sword. So this is Marathi's sword. And what's really nice about this item is that it's a perpetual debuff. So it's not something like the Sword of Crone we talked about that is for a period of uh, 38 seconds in that case. But uh, Marathi's sword is constant. So it has an area of effect around her. It's 40 meters. But whenever anyone is near Marathi, they have negative nine melee defense and negative nine melee attack. And what makes a sword so damn good is the fact of how well it stacks with her enchanting beauty. So Marathi has another debuff, which isn't an item, but rather it's an ingrained ability on her, and it lowers those stats uh, as well. I believe it's a melee attack. So in total, a Marathi is going to be lowering the melee attack of nearby troops by 18, which is crazy. So you have these elite units that have like 40 melee attacks. Suddenly they're down to like 22, which is like the tier of like goblins and things like that. So Marathi might not be the most like raw, powerful duelist in the world, but when you're going fist to cuffs with Big Mom and Marathi, you better watch out. So you use the Heart Render and the Dark Sword, as well as that Enchanting Beauty, which is really going to be nullifying those uh, heavy stats that your opponents may have. So the next item we're going to be talking about here on this list is over in the realm of the Empire. The Emperor, Karl Franz, wields it. It is the Reikland Runefang. So this is good for pretty much the exact same reason we just talked about for the Sword of Corone. It gives plus 8 leadership and plus 24 melee attack to nearby allies. And this can be in Karl Franz dueling someone. This can be for the Royal Altar of Griffites nearby. It's, yeah, it's pretty much the same type of effect, but it's really good with the Empire because Empire oftentimes, they kind of for forsake the infantry game a little bit. Their state troops and their flagellants and their Sigmar sons basically just hold the line where while well, Karl Franz and the Demogriff Knights and the Empire Knights and their more mobile assets or maybe their missiles depending on the circumstances but generally their cav and go and just hammer different areas so Karl Franz can fly in he can pop the Reichland Runefang and suddenly a matchup in which your Empire Knights or your Demogriff Knights might be losing suddenly they're winning they're fighting longer due to the leadership it's just a great item so next guys we're going to be heading on over to the realm of the green skins or I should say the uh the pits wherever they reside and it is going to be the bonewood staff which is an item available to Wurzog to great green profit so honestly if I had to like do a list and in this video again it's not a list video but I would say that the bonewood staff would either be like one two or three it's somewhere in the top three it is an insanely powerful item so get this every time Wurzog casts a single spell it doesn't matter it can be a dinky spell it can be a fist of gork it can be a foot of gork anything that he casts your entire army no not just like an area of units your entire army gets 12 melee attack and a charge bonus of 18 this is probably 
one of the most insane items in the game. You can have like a horde of goblins and savage orcs and suddenly your goblins are going to have like 30 plus melee attack or savage orcs are just going to be hitting a whole level above their the, the price point that you're paying for them. And it's a really easy item to trigger. You're just constantly casting spells. So if you layer your spells correctly, bring Fist of Gork and a Brain Buster, for example, two dirt cheap spells, and you're constantly cycling them in a very efficient manner, your entire army is pretty much going to have plus 12 melee attack for most of the battle, or at least the important parts of the battle. Uh, the Bonewood Staff uh, activated ability does last for 17 seconds, and the cooldown for some of those cheap spells is like in that ballpark anyway. So Bonewood Staff, just uh, an insane item. And if you guys haven't tried it on your green skins, give it a try. You're going to like the way it looks, I guarantee it. Next, guys, we're going to be going to the High Elves for the Star of Avalorn, which is available to Ilariel the Ever Pigeon. So you get two charges of this. It has 120 second cooldown. It lasts for 27 seconds. And basically this is regrowth on a stick. Alariel has access to some pretty good spells as is. She has Earth Flood, she has Tempest, she has Foz Protection. But on top of that, she gets a free regrowth, two charges that's AOE, AOE free regrowths that cost no wins of magic. It is so insane. And honestly, the Star of Avalorn is one of the main reasons why the High Elves can be competitive in many respects. You see this often used on uh, Dragon Princes and, and Phoenixes and Star Dragons, and the amount of value you get from this is, it's just insane. I've seen games where the High Elves have screwed up, their opponent outplayed them horribly. A Star Dragon gets taken down to like half health, but suddenly an Earthblood and a Star of, Avalorn, uh, Star of Avalorn later, it's a whole new game. It's a whole new world. I'm gonna break out into like a Disney song here, but nonetheless, Star of Avalorn, this would probably be in my top three as well if I had to with the Bonewood Staff. Next, guys, we have a, a fairly boring item in terms of its uh, story and lore, but it's the Tormentor Sword. So this is available to a couple characters, the High Beastmaster for the Dark Elves and also for the Night Goblin uh, War Boss available to the Greenskins. I think there might be one or two others who can get it. But I'm pretty sure those are the uh, the two that come to mind here. So the Tormentor Sword has been an item with a very controversial history. Uh, it lasts for nine seconds. It lowers melee attack by 24. And it also snares things in place. So this is just really good. It has a minute and a half cooldown. So a little bit shorter than items like Sword of Corone and Reichland Runefang. And it's arguably better than both of them. Uh, it lowers melee attack by 24. It snares things in place. And snares are probably one of the most powerful mechanics in the entire game. So Tormentor Sword certainly going to be earning a spot here. It snares things in place, allows you to nuke them allows you to snipe them, allows you to get away. So much purpose on that, or so much uh, variance that you can have on that item. And it also lowers melee attack. So if you're in a big blob fight versus enemy calf, why not put their melee attack down to almost zero? Can't complain. So the next item would probably be number one, two, or three, maybe even number one here. And this is going to be over in the Skaven, uh, Skaven uh, Burrows, I suppose. And it's going to be the Libra Bubonicus available to Lord Skrulk. So this is like Spirit Leech on steroids. And it's, it's guaranteed value. There's many things in this game that are, you have to be in a certain radius or you have to like, you know, time it correctly, a skill shot. But Libra Bubonicus is literally point, click, kill. It has a hundred meter range, which is pretty damn good. It's almost as much as like hand gunners or something like that. And it's it's just a, a souped up spirit leech. Not much more to say than that. A scroll can point, he can kill. It's really good with Skaven who already have a ton of focus fire. If somebody slips up for even a second, Howling Warp Gale, Warp Lightning Cannons, Rattling Gunners, Gisales, shoot that thing, Libra Bubonicus, finish it off. So Libra Bubonicus probably would be number one if I were doing it in the list format, but uh, nonetheless, it is an insane item. Next, guys, we're going to the realm of Arkin the Black and the followers of Nagash, or just the Tomb Kings, I should say. And it's going to be the Tomb Blade of Arkin. So this item has five charges, uh, two minute cooldown, but typically Tomb King's battles are very long and grindy anyways. And Arkin has the ability to instantly summon skeletons. There's not really a timer on it. And he summons a larger group of skeleton warriors. So it has 150 as opposed to 120. So this is really good for targeting your opponent's advance. Let's say they have some Demogriff Knights charging a construct. Bam, slap some skeletons on it. It's like it's like WD-40. It's like fix it all tape. You just slap these bad boys down. It blocks your opponent. It's 150 skeletons. They cause fear. It's really strong. Now, just summoning skeletons on its own isn't insane, but the fact that it has five charges and it also synergizes really well with Arkin's ability to uh, reset cooldowns with the Staff of Nagash, it's just insane. And I think the Tomb Blade of Arkin is one of the more definitive items available to the Tomb Kings. So next, guys, we're going to be jumping to the last item here on this list. And it is going to be the Helm of Discord. A lot of people are probably like, where the hell is that damn Helm of Discord? But this item is good for the same reason that the Reichland Runefang is good, the Sword of Crone is good, the Tormentor Sword. It has immediate AOE debuffs, but this one in particular is really nasty. Uh, negative 24 melee defense, negative 24 melee attack. And most baseline troops are going to be like uh, state troops or baseline infantry troops. Like this will put Black Orcs down to zero melee defense. It'll put most Cav units down to an extremely low defensive values and pretty, you know, a substantial nerf to their offensive output with the melee attack. 
So the Helm of Discord is something that has been bounced around from characters. It's been taken off characters. It's been added back on. It's uh, it's something that has been a little bit controversial in the past, but now it is available to a couple characters. I believe the uh, Blood Dragon Vampire Lord is the one that comes to mind who has that. And without this item, he just wouldn't be picked. It's it's the reason why he's good. And you know that's kind of the case for most of these items. Like, let's go ahead and take a look. So uh, Luan without Sword of Crone would be okay. It wouldn't. He it would still be good because he regenerates and would still be picked, but he'd be nowhere near. Staff of Ruinous Corruption, Worker without that would just be like a, a kind of a limp foot lord that has one little summon. Uh, Heartrend of the Dark Sword, Marathi would probably be fine without it. Reichland Ruinfang, Franz would probably be okay without that. Bonewood Staff is a pretty big incentive to bring Warzog, but he also has Effigy of the Git. So, um, you know, it, it, it's back and forth there. The Star of Avalorn, Alariel probably wouldn't see much play without that. You would see Teclis and Tyrion instead. Uh, Tormentor Sword and the Goblin Bo Big Boss, you just wouldn't see that him picked without this, like if he didn't have this item. So you can see it kind of a recurring example from any of these different items, right? Like they, they are what makes their respective character choices. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video and this breakdown of the 10 best items for Total War Warhammer 2 multiplayer. And again, remember, this is for multiplayer. I know some of my videos, uh, most of my videos in general are going to be very heavily on multiplayer as well as battles and things like that. So uh, just take it with a grain of salt there. So guys, thank you so much for joining. Hopefully you enjoyed. If there's any other subject matter you'd like to see covered pertaining to multiplayer or even campaign, I'd be happy to start branching out to some campaign videos eventually when it comes to like lists and things like that. But there are far better campaign players than I out there, so I would definitely check them out. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed, and we will see you guys next time. Take care. Humans.